687 days for Mars to go around the sun. So Santa will only have to drop by the red planet every other year. That'll save some wear and tear on his sled and give Rudolph a break. We hope you're taking a break and enjoying the holiday season. Best wishes from all of us at H2O Radio, and we'll be back on January 8th. This Week in Water is supported by the American Water Works Association. Sustainable water management means more than just conservation. Learn about water efficiency and resilience at awwa.org slash sustainable. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report on Morning Minute for Friday, December 23, 2016. I'm Russell Mulkyber. T-Mobile employees under pressure to meet sales goals are sometimes driven to mislead customers or to enroll them in services they didn't ask for. That's according to a complaint filed by Change to Win with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The labor group claimed that T-Mobile sets unrealistic sales targets that encourage workers to act in ways that may not benefit consumers. The group found that some workers said they felt pressured to add insurance, phone lines, and other services that customers didn't explicitly ask for to meet sales targets and earn commission payments. The findings were based on a review of consumer complaints collected by the Federal Trade Commission, a consumer protection agency, interviews with workers, and online surveys of people who identified themselves as T-Mobile employees and customers. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mulcahy. What's an old Lang Syne anyway? Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. It's a song written in part by the Scottish poet Robert Burns in 1778 and set to the tune of a traditional Scottish folk song. A-U-L-D is Old English for old, Lang is Old English for long, and Zine is Scottish for since. So Old Lang Syne translates literally as old, long, since. A somewhat looser translation, long ago or days gone by. The Brits brought the song around the world as they colonized, and Canadian band leader Guy Lombardo popularized it in America by playing it every New Year's Eve beginning in 1929, first on the radio and later on television. As a matter of historical coincidence, shortly after Robert Burns wrote his poem, Americans wrote Our Constitution with its guarantee of freedom of speech, a freedom that includes the right to write and read poetry and prose, and to sing and to compose and listen to music, and to create sculpture and paintings and plays and music and dance, and to express ourselves in a thousand different ways. For the founders who long, long ago gave us freedom of speech, we lift a cup of kindness and days of old lang syne. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil It's Liberties. time for Paleo Radio, only on Secular Media Network. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome to Paleo Radio with your host, Jeremiah Bannister and Joe. Welcome to another edition of Paleo Radio, live here in studio, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. My name is Joe Elder. And I'm the paleocrat, Jeremiah Bannister. And thank you guys for joining us this day after wonderful Christmas. How was your Christmas, Uh, JB? Dude, it was interesting, man. It was the first Christmas without Samantha. Yes. And for those who don't know, my daughter died in July of a rare kind of brain cancer. And so this was an interesting Christmas. Christmas was kind of our holiday, Joe. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm a real big Christmas guy, not going to lie. And the whole family is. And so we used to go. In fact, I used to go to church on Christmas Eve. That's even been kind of a custom a practice of mine since I, even as an unbeliever, I've gone. But I didn't go this year. And the night before Christmas was real tough, man. I spent a lot of time alone. But then Christmas Day turned out being, honestly, one of the best Christmas days I've had in a long, long time. And my son, I I posted a picture on Facebook. My son Ambrose, he said that it was the best Christmas ever, in his opinion, but there was an element of it that was real sad, and that's that Sammy wasn't there. 
Yeah. And I think that the way he said it and the way he framed it and even the attitude that he said it in, I think that honestly was probably the best summation of how we all felt as a family. But, dude, it was awesome. We got to go to Battle Creek, ate tons of ham. Good. It was delicious. Eggnog. Loved it. Some Christmas ham. What That's always do, great. Joe? Well, I went up and visited with my family up in my hometown of Everett. We had a good time. Uh, two Christmas parties on Christmas Eve. And then we managed to come back home and just have a day to with my girlfriend and myself on Christmas Day. So, a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds like tons of fun. You know, I have, I don't think I've ever hosted a show the day after Christmas. I don't think I ever I, have either. I'm serious. I don't think I've ever done it. And I, I was thinking a couple days ago, in fact, we talked about it. And I said, you know, do you want to do this? <laughs> should, we, <laughs> should we call the station and say, hey, man, you know, I mean, this is... It's the day after Christmas. Just let us chill. And I thought, and I said, not only is this show just like super amazing, but I said, I don't really know if there's a cooler way to spend uh, the second day of Christmas, in Grand Rapids at least. That's right. If, and we're, if we're not in Grand Rapids, I mean, come on. And hey, know. look, I don't, get to take, I don't get to take work off of my other job, so I figure why yeah. not take, why, uh, take work off of this one? Well, right? and it would be a total bummer. I mean, imagine, I think this would, if we didn't do this this week at all, I don't think our listeners would have a New Year's episode. Yeah, and that would be just awful. That would be terrible. And so we have to make some accommodations for that. But we do have a great lineup of, of topics here. I mean, so many it's hard to, hard to put in order. <laughs> Who knows if yeah. we'll get to all of them. Yeah. But uh, just a few. The uh, Berlin attack in Europe and how people are weighing their freedoms against security kind of sounds familiar it from does. Our, what we did around 2001. It kind of it sounds like the same thing. And, you know, I know that's not the point of the article. In fact, if you talk to the writer of the article, I don't know if the writer would even say that that was on that person's mind. But as you're reading it, if you're an astute person and if you're listening to the show you definitely are uh then you would see and you'd say well i kind of kind of hear echoes of george bush right i hear echoes of ashcroft i i've heard these kind of statements before and i you know so we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about and i thought this was super duper interesting joe the very first war on Christmas in America, and who waged it? Yeah. And Unbelievable. It, and something that you wouldn't expect, right? <laughs> well, you know, I learned more about the history of Christmas in this country by reading this, this article. Maybe than ever, I've just kind of, I've just kind of always thought in my, in my mind that maybe Christmas has always been pretty cool here. Well, not necessarily true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hasn't always been widely accepted. Um, after that, we're going to talk about what happened with the U.N. and Israel and illegal settlements and what the U.N. decided on, what the U.S. voted on, and uh, how that's kind of produced some turmoil in Israel and in the United States. And how Trump is pretending to be a cowboy clown. He's basically a dude going in there saying, it's going to be different when I come in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to recognize, Mr. Trump, that there are a lot of other countries that signed on to this. And in fact... It's interesting. We're going to talk about exactly what these countries are. We're also going to talk. This is an interesting one, Joe. The Arc Rainbow. Yes. Ken We're, Ham trying Ken to take Ham. back that rainbow. He is. Because the he's, gays have so much, right? Well, he's been at this now for a long time. He's been one of those guys who's wanting to reclaim the rainbow uh, for Jesus for a long time. So we're going to talk about that. And then... Uh, this is kind of a longer one, but I think that it's a really good one. It's an, it's about nationalism and uh, the interplay between globalism and nationalism. How do uh, different groups come together if they realize that they exist and that they have to coexist for yeah. there to be any kind of peace at all or order or structure? And what is the explanation for the rise of, of these people? I think it's an interesting bit of analysis. Don't agree entirely. We're going to talk about that, Joe. Yes, we are. So, again, we have a ton of different ton of topics, ton, ton of different stuff. We're going to lead in here with an AP article, um, After Berlin Attack, Europe Weighs Freedom Against Security. This is by Angela Charlton of Associated Press. And it says, Europe's open borders symbolize liberty and forward thinking, but they increasingly look like the continent's Achilles heel. Um, and just before we get too far into this, we have to draw the parallels, and this is what we're going to do, is draw the parallels between this and how the country was reacting in the United States in 2001 after the September 11th terrorist attacks. Because the, what's going on it with, with pushing 
this more nationalistic fervor in in Europe. Um, it's kind of worrying me because I think that you have a fast track to people really f- letting go of a lot of individual freedoms they have to trade it off for the security that they want. And I always think that's a little bit of a scary game to be playing. I'm not entirely sure it's too scary, but I'm more nationalistic than you, Joe. Yes. I am. We're kind of <laughs> – that's, that's one, of, one of the differences we have. Obviously, I would be – I'm not at all uh, happy and excited to see the rise of the neo-Nazis in certain countries. I obviously think that's a terrible thing. But I would, obvi- I would say there's a distinction between a rise of a, a nationalist reaction – to the advances of globalism and the kind of freedoms and the kind of lifestyles that that flourish from that over time, that you're going to have this interplay, this back and forth. And, you know, I don't know how long nationalism is going to thrive. I know that it's made kind of a comeback right now, but I don't know. I mean, I guess, I, I guess my projection would be that we'll always have an element of nationalism. You'll always have this kind of interplay back and forth. Mm-hmm. But nationalism seems to be losing the long game. It seems to be losing the long game. My worry is that whenever it comes back, it usually doesn't have a very good dial of when to stop. Mm. It comes back harder. and fa- it, it, Very, very seldomly do we see a country become more nationalistic and up at security and not become a little bit more of a paranoid country either. They, they, it usually comes all in tandem. But it, interesting nonetheless. Um, I am stalling a little bit here because my computer's frozen, I'll openly admit. Um, if you can cover a little yeah, bit of the article, I'll, this. I'll get, Why not? I'll so, get okay. it going. Paris AP, Europe's open borders symbolize liberty and forward thinking, but they increasingly look like the continent's Achilles heel. Europe's number one terrorism suspect crossed at least two borders this week, despite an international manhunt, and was felled only by chance in a random ID check. I thought that was... A thing, mm-hmm. right? I said, you know, but it's a big thing. It's a continent. You know, yeah, and, and in the it, article, they're kind of, they kind of, well, wow, I don't understand how they didn't get him. It's like, yeah. it's a guy. Well, it's, and it's, think about it, like, how many times has yeah. there been an, a national manhunt in the U.S. and the guy crossed two states? Imagine right. if they said our security forces are, are just inept. Because it's unbelievable. This, this man made it two states in our 50-state continent, he went our 50-state country. He went from Michigan to uh, Indiana to Ohio. Yes, and so we're awful. We're, we're totally And we couldn't hosed. check him. Yeah. So you have this, they have a random ID check, and that's kind of what that's, <laughs> that you catch people that way. It's a net. So the bungled chase for Berlin attack suspect Anise Amri is just one example of recent cross-border security failures that are emboldening nationalists fed up with European identity. Extremist violence, they argue, is too high a price to pay for the freedom to travel. And you hear this. This is kind of a debate, Joe, you hear in the United States. When people go, listen, you know, um, even with refugees, I think lying underneath it is this idea of saying, well, you know, yes, it's true. You can bring people over, but you have to have a risk assessment. And you have the paranoia of the nationalists, and the rise of nationalism is in part attributable to an increased sense of paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. So they're, they're, like you've brought this up many times talking about uh, the probability that somebody would actually be hurt by a terrorist in this country. Yeah. What is the actual probability? I think the other thing, too, is it is interesting, and there's the argument for sovereignty, which I understand, but it's interesting to me the way that we look at Europe so much different than the U.S., where you have a certain amount of money that goes into the entire thing, and it's all one entity. Like, in my view, I think that the European Union is one whole entity in the same way that the United States is one whole entity. So it's funny to me in Europe because there's plenty of different countries that are very small. Their GDP is very low, like to the equivalent of something like Vermont. But people talk about how it would be impossible to allow people to cross across the entire thing. I just think it's kind of an ironic thing. Like, imagine states saying that they no longer want open borders for people to travel from the U.S. because terrorism's too scary. I mean, where they said we want to have a checkpoint at the border of Michigan into Wisconsin and into Indiana and into Ohio because that's actually what it's more like in the in Europe, other than a bunch of sovereign states. I mean, most of some of these countries, like Estonia and Latvia, are they're smaller than New Hampshire. It would be, but for a more direct parallel, it would be 
the debate over interstate travel in an America with open borders. Mm -hmm. Or where you're just taking in a bunch of people where you can just kind of come in and then you don't have control over that part of the decision. But then you don't have control either over the decisions made on where to go around. The state doesn't get to choose who's a U.S. citizen. And the government gets to choose that, right? And it's kind of the same as the EU chooses who's going to be U, uh, Europeans. But the the individual countries don't get to choose who all is part of Europe or not. I, I don't know. I, it's an interesting debate. Plus, sovereignty is a real thing. I mean, these are countries that are, have their own – they have their own sovereignty. I think that we'll always have that. I yeah. Like when we say nationalism, globalism, I think that they aren't diametrically opposed. I think the UN is the, the, is the natural adaptation of a global – political spectrum where you have individual groups that ha- come and send representatives and they come and they talk in a grand scale or they have that that big open forum and that's where they try to make their policy. And if you ever hear if you ever hear anybody that says uh, nationalism is dead or globalism is dead. If you ever hear that phrase, think back to William Buckley. William F <laughs> Buckley Jr. Think back, what was it, Joe? Big Will Buckley. What was it that was dead? Oh, yes, it was liberalism. Liberalism is dead. Liberalism is dead. Yeah, liberalism is dead. Yeah, and so, like, that's something he said on his show when talking about, well, look at at the the triumph of Ronald Reagan and that because Ronald Reagan won, that liberalism was gone. Yes. It's obviously a joke. So if you hear anybody start talking like that, whether about nationalism or whether about globalism, and you're going to hear that, especially around election time, where uh, the winner... Of that will be like the losers gone forever Mm -hmm. until next time kind of talk. And you got to look at it that way. All right. We have a caller right out of the gate. Stan from Grand Rapids. He wants to talk about Europe. What's going on, Stan? How are you? Hey, Stan. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. How are you? Hey, um, I'm just uh, really uh, enjoying your comment about the European unity there. I think their biggest problem is economic. Uh, dealing with the money. Yeah, uh, sure. They don't sure. have a common, especially when they try to include uh, Great Britain, which has a different kind of money, and also the fact that there's no Europe, there's no there's no common economic bounds. Uh, I think they had a problem with what was what country was that Greece or something that was uh, yes that they bailed actually, out. The euro is not the euro is not strong. In all of the countries, and I think that's going to be the break. That's going to break it down. But just to point counterpoint, Stan, Greece didn't want to go to their uh, actual old currency because it was so bad that they knew they weren't going to be able to make any financial moves. So Greece actually begged, begged to get euros instead of their basic currency because their their currency was actually worth less. So as bad as the euro is. When you look at other countries, the Britain sterling stayed as high as it was because Britain never actually formally joined in the same way that other countries did. They kept a very, kind of an arm's length relationship with the EU, and the sterling was able to uh, to withhold it. Now that they haven't even announced that they're leaving yet, they haven't even signed Article Fifty, and the sterling is lower than it's been in a long time. It's actually the lowest it's been since nineteen seventy. Yeah, I don't know if you've got a radio on or if you've got us on speaker, but we got an echo in the background there, Stan. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yep. Is that, is that any better? I That's much keep... better. That's okay, getting there. I'm it's getting well, it's getting there. You're getting better, buddy. It's yeah, the day after I Christmas. Know all these things. It's the day after Christmas, so we're going to forgive you. It's the second right, day, but, uh, the best second I day ever. Yeah, I just love you guys' uh, yeah. intellectual approach to these matters. Uh, the funny, the funny thing is, though, I think what they're trying to do. What the common mind is trying to do is say, okay, we're going to compare a set of different states, European states, compared to America. And America, of course, with our states, especially since the colonizing of the United States, we have we have common travel, we have common money, we have much. I mean, I mean, it's not completely common, but you know, I mean, freedom and all the laws apply to all the states and everything. So. Of course, we had the Civil War to kind of like straighten things out, but I think that Europe is not going to meet all those criteria, especially with the money and the way, uh, uh, you know, Great Britain. Is Great Britain part of Europe or not? You know, that's the other question. Yeah, that that is a very good question. I think you bring up a lot of good points, Stan. We're going to have to let you go, but thank okay. you for your comments. All right.
Thank you. Thank you. And if you would like to call in, make sure 616-656-1680. Again, one more time, 616-656-1680. We love the, the conversations all the time. And, and as the show progresses, you're welcome to call and refer back to any topic that we've discussed uh, throughout the whole conversation. We're up on the first break, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We'll continue this for just a couple minutes before we move on. But again, you're up what's going on with uh, security terrorism, which is something we really have to get into and the, the crux of the argument. But stick around, folks. Paleo Radio will be right back. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. We'd be totally amiss, Joe, if we didn't talk about this, buddy. What's that? It's a big deal, George Michael. Oh, yeah. Yeah. George Michael passed away. It's a big time bummer, no doubt about it. We, uh, I got the news yesterday, man, probably like everybody else, like Barack Obama, uh, by the media. And so, <laughs> Barack Obama gets everything by the media, so hey, we, yeah, yeah, uh, we're part of that, but we... Uh, it was a bummer, and I, it was interesting to see so many people talk about how in 2016 there were so many individuals who died. Yes. And actually, you brought this up. Uh, you Tons. Brought, you brought this up, I think, on, on Saturday, talking with me. Turns out maybe that's the reason why George Michael died, John. Well, maybe so. Maybe and Carrie Fisher you, may pass away here soon. <laughs> right, and it's because you brought it up. I did it. You spoke it into yeah. existence. So... But yes. no, in all seriousness, it's a, a big deal. And yes, Miss Fisher, I mean, you're talking uh, major heart attack. Yeah. Big time. Full Alan, blown. Alan Rickman, Gene Wilder, Muhammad Ali. Unbelievable. It's a, mean, it's a laundry list of people. David Bowie. David Bowie. Yes. And so Prince. 2016. Prince. Oh, my gosh. So 2016, Samantha. Samantha. Samantha Bannister. Mm-hmm. You know, huge, huge people who, mm-hmm. who passed away. And I... Uh, so if you've got anything you'd like to say about them in memoriam, make sure to give us a call, 616-656-1680. And i got to say this. I'm super pumped, man, because Christopher Tanner, our friend from Cellar Skeptics, he made a meme that was hilarious. Yes, he did. And he shared it. But he's got to share it on Paleo Radio's Facebook page. And you can find that by going to facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. Yes, you can. Thank yeah. you. Selfless plug. Love yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Um, continuing this Business Insider article, or the AP article through Business Insider, mm-hmm. um, we are talking about after the Berlin attack in Europe that they are weighing their freedom over their security, which is obviously something that is a normal reaction to have. And this is what Marie Le Pen has said about how she feels about Europe's free movement. And this is really what the crux of it is. Most nationalistic countries in Europe are having a serious problem with the, the free movement, the uh, unrestricted access to different countries. And Marie Le Pen is a far-right nationalistic party leader from France, and she says, quote, The myth of total free movement in Europe, which my rivals are clinging to in this presidential election, should be definitely buried. Our security depends on it. And she said this is a statement on Friday calling for the free travel zone to be a to- it, as it is, is a total security catastrophe. And she says it poses a dilemma for EU devotees like Angela Merkel, who's facing mm-hmm. election battles next year. Now, Angela Merkel is obviously for the open borders. She's for the right. open or the freedom of movement. Um, well, she's been kind of an interesting character. Merkel. Yeah, she, yeah, she, she has. is. I mean, there are some times where... You know, I mean, she seems committed to open borders, and yet she's been critical of multiculturalism. So I think that the one thing that Merkel has really struggled with is to find how do you bridge that gap? How do you have open borders and, and have the, inevitab- the inevitability of a multicultural society uh, in a world of open borders where you're surrounded by countries that are not as well off – as a, a collection of countries that are, you're inevitably going to have a more multicultural country. And being Western and liberal, uh, these countries, they're going to increasingly want to have that reflected in their law. I don't think that they've adequately, and part of it's the nature of an emergency being thrust I, I think them. a that's, high percentage of yeah, it is the nature that's of the why emergency. You, I'm not too judgmental on that about that. But I mm-hmm. think that is a task – that people who are advocates of open borders and of, of the free travel 
that they need to figure out. And I think part of that is this discussion is talking about what are the pitfalls in our security, Mm -hmm. for example. True. Right. Yes. But they need to realize, too, that this is actually an issue where we are kind of a little ahead of them on this one. <laughs> well, we, well, I think we've at least way. yes, I think we've at least made a, a poor decision and we've paid for it. Um, I don't think people in America today, hey, given the fact that look, um, has nine eleven been the only terrorist attack since September or, or since in the U.S. since we've beefed up our security? No, not even close. Ha- has has Homeland Security been able to issue us dossier after dossier of the plethora of terrorist attacks that they've stopped? No, no, we don't have that. We have a well, lot they of they can they can point to in in fairness they can point to uh, plots that have been foiled. Yeah, you know, and we we brought some of these up when talking about uh, there was a, a congressman or senator I, I I failed to remember who it is at the time. But that published something to do with the number of refugees specifically. It was back in the heyday when people were kind of Christmas time last year, actually, uh, Mm -hmm. when this was going on. And he published a report that was listing a whole bunch of uh, scenarios and incidents in this country where uh, intelligence gathering and even monitoring, for example, that this resulted in the foiling of multiple terror plots Mm -hmm. by people who were specific. And he was – tailoring it specific to that because of the debate but in fairness you can say that but the flip side is that comes with the price tag a big one i mean that's kind of like saying hey you know we we really cut down on on traffic violations we took everybody's driver's licenses yeah no one drives now <laughs> right so no one dies in a car accident <laughs> and the uh, ends don't justify the means and just because you can say hey there are some good things that came about from this doesn't necessarily mean that the means that you use to get to that are good yes well and that's yeah. that's the thing is we especially in the united states we have a tendency to have a policy run ran shot once it's implemented So it snowballs. And the idea of we're going to collect data on people to make sure people aren't terrorists has snowballed into the largest collection agency of all time, the largest metadata collection collection agency of all time. And so I worry that Europe following that, that it becomes militaristic and it becomes covert and you it does produce some problems. But this is something that I think the EU free zone people have uh, defended that, that I think is worth mentioning going back into the article. Defenders of the EU's border-free zone say the security failures show the need for more cooperation among European governments and even shared militaries, not new barriers. Hidebound habits of hoarding intelligence within centuries-old borders, they contend, are part of the problem, not the solution. That is what the – there's the echo. Yeah. When, when they talk about, man, you know, these intelligence agencies are just having a hard time communicating with each other. We really need to streamline mm-hmm. this process. Mm-hmm. Anytime you hear that. Those whispers have that <laughs> that is coming from whispers yes. uh, behind closed doors with shady figures. Believe me, yeah. any time that you have this kind of thing, I know that it sounds terrible to say, but there is actually a benefit at times to things not being the most efficient in the world. Yes. Believe it or not. Do you think that when you have a <laughs> sovereign na- – this is my – my issue is that this is the same end game that Marie Le Pen wants. She wants to have – Security forces in France and Britain cooperating militaristically in a streamlined one. But she wants it to be even more covert and less open and not in a huge entity that we're all part of. She wants it to be, I have a sovereign nation, but I have access to that, all that militaristic uh, hardware to be able to look through in other countries. And see, this. So that's, that's another problem. This is the thing, too, is you look at these people like Le Pen, you look at people. Like Alex Jones, and I'll take him as a as an example because I've watched his career for a long time. Although I never knew he was so skinny when he was younger, I had no idea. It looked totally different. It was unbelievable. But anyway, so you know, getting on there talking about uh, the police state, talking about martial law. How many documentaries has this guy made in his lifetime that talk about police and and show them mm-hmm. looking as if they're in a war zone? Because they are. That's how they're they're geared up. And he talks about that. He literally flipped a switch. Yeah, he's it's done amazing. with that. He's it's, done with that now. It's remarkable to see that all of a sudden, when you are close to that proximity of power, that all of a sudden, boom, flip the switch, yep. flip the switch. All of a sudden now, he's down with that because, oh, of course, under, under his uh, uh, leadership, 
They won't mess of, it up. They would never. They can do handle that. that responsibility. We would just look that way, but we would have no reason to use them. Yeah, but only, not against only, our own citizens. Only if we had to. Yeah, only if we had to. And now you're you're back into the whole same mushy debate as you are with hum- humanitarian interventionism. Mm-hmm. You say, well, on what basis are you going to bring out the army against the people? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like, when do you do What it? are you doing this for? But you see this happen. And we're going to talk later in a segment about nationalism about kind of why this happens and the predictability mm-hmm. of it and what we can do in this cyclical nature of things – to, to quell it. <laughs> yes. Maybe in the future, in the way that this thing pr- kind of processes through. But it's, it's absolutely remarkable, Joe, to see how quickly and how profoundly somebody can do a 180 on an issue that they're so committed to. He has investment bias out of his ears, out of his yes. whatever. You yeah, know? no, absolutely. He really does. He has, he has it coming out from everywhere. He, the guy, you go back and you look and you say, was he against the police state? Yes. Was he against martial law? Yes. Did he give all these warnings about what it looks like when it's about to happen? Yes. Is he supporting all those things now because he supports Donald Trump? Yes. Yes. Remarkable. Yes. Amazing. He's flipped. And, and just where... I find this one to be funny, too, where Barack Obama, for eight years, a lot of people that followed Obama um, poo-pooed the concerns of people that were conservative as, and chalked them up to just being racist. You know, you guys are just racist, and you're sad, and your your butt is sore because you lost, and that's why you guys are talking this way. And now the right is doing that to the left, and the left is flipping out over it because they're saying, no, we have real legitimate concerns. And they're like, no, you little crybabies who live in your mama's basement and have participation mm-hmm. trophies. That, that's what they're being told, and that's why the response is so vehement. That It's actually what – I know this is a side note here, but this is actually what really worries me about our discourse in our country is that – I was concerned when liber- when liberals were doing that to conservatives for the f- last eight years, and now I'm very concerned that the script has just been flipped and the discourse has not opened up one inch, not one inch. An, an entire transition of power discourse has not gotten better at all. That's why this show is so important. Patreon.com slash Paleo Radio. It's that simple. You That's gotta a perfect go. stop. You, you got to go check it out. That's why this is important. Stan, thank you so much for saying what you said. We try to talk about these issues in a way that you just simply don't hear anywhere else. We'll be back right after this with more Paleo Radio, 616-656-1680. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. A big shout out to a hardcore paleocrat, a true blue freaking geek foaming at the mouth in West Virginia, Mel Rice. Yeah, Mel, shout out to you. Thank you very much for all you do for Paleo Radio and your support. Yeah, actually, you know, she shared privately. We have uh, some connections here, but she shared a meme a couple of them. There was a couple of renditions of a picture of you and I, Joe. Yeah. And totally awesome. Great, great fan art. Love it like crazy. But wanted to give a shout out because she's able to listen today. And she posted that on Facebook. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash paleo radio. Yep, absolutely. So let's talk about Ken Ham. This is a big deal, Joe. We'll talk about <laughs> Kenneth Ham. <laughs> Ken Ham. I saw this man over on. Uh, the Friendly Atheist page. And, you know, we mention this guy a lot, uh, Hamant Mehta. We mention him pretty regularly. I encourage people to go check him out. Friendly Atheist blog over at Pathios. Very, very cool. But, yeah, Ken Ham, man, he lit up the, the arc because he wants to take the rainbow back from LGBT people. Yes, because like we were saying before, you know, gay people, they're just taking so many things that straight people can't have or religious people can't have that we have to take something back from them. Well, and why can't they also have it? I mean, why can't, no. why can't they use it? No, like, no one can. If they want to use it for the ark, I don't think gay people would be mad if they lit it up like a rainbow and said, hey, it's part of our, the story. So we have a rainbow that goes with the ark. I yes. don't think gay people would be furious about that, and but he made it something. He made it a thing. Like, rather than simply make it a rainbow, he's like, we're doing this to poke gay people in the eyeballs. Yes. Yeah, well, we need to. Yeah. That's what why? he thinks. <laughs> why, even, why even take that approach? Why not just simply, again, why not just cast a spectrum of color on the arc and just call it 
even Stevens, take and, pictures of it and say it's beautiful and say, oh, it's part of the story. And don't you think he uh, – do you think he does it just to be combative? Yes, I mean, at totally. a certain point, it's just because just he's being combative. 100%. Yeah, It's absolutely. the only way he gets attention anymore. I agree. He's he's literally lose. He's lost the the argument for years. It's not even. It's not when people say the debate. He's not part of that. No, he's not a real part of that debate. He and people need no. to understand that who who look to him as a serious guy. They need to realize that that person is not actually part. No. of the debate because he's taken himself out of it. And there's a reason why post Bill Nye, nobody respected his. Has Nobody. debated him again, no. and the thing too is Bill Nye even thought he shouldn't, because Bill Nye said that this guy's arguments are not not well established. Like, I mean, they had a two hour long debate, and Ken Ham driveled it down to, well, I have a book that does have all the answers, and if you just understood it better, you would know. And it driveled down from it was basically that, and it was, well. Science has to be seen, and you weren't here to see it, so that's why evolution and geology is not real, because you can't watch it happen with your own eyes in one lifetime. It's just a total misconception for what science and proof and evidence is. It's remarkable, and you you know that somebody is not doing a good job, right, uh, in the game of thinking. When Whenever an argument comes up, and your idea at first isn't just simply, let me look and see what this is actually saying, and let's, let's find out what's going on with this. But your first one is, let me go back to my presuppositions and my, confer- my biases, and then go and, and figure out yeah. how I can show this to be wrong. Well, it's, it's basically, yeah, having that lens that you look through, and someone's saying, I think that lens is a little foggy, I don't think it works. And you're like, well, let me put that idea through my foggy lens and see if it comes out bad. Now, everybody does that. In a way, sure, we right? Do. We all, yep. we, every single person. I'm, I'm not meaning to yep. say that Ken Ham does it specifically, but at the base of Ken Ham's biases, it would be a statement in the debate, which to me, there would be no reason to debate somebody who f- ends with this, that there's no evidence that could actually be brought up that you could actually give that person that they would even think is serious, that they would even take as serious because their faith trumps all those things. Mm-hmm. So, so they, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You could you could craft the best argument in the world. The guy begins with the assumption not just that it's most probably true, but that it's definite and that you can know it 100 percent for certain. And it's exactly the way that he and his people at the trailer park facilities got are putting together these these hoax papers and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just ridiculous. It is. The it's whole a, the whole thing's a joke. It is a big joke. And well, and so is so is the arcs. So is that whole deal but going back to the ark and the rainbow this is what ken ham is relying upon he's re- relying upon genesis nine sixteen that says everlast the everlasting covenant between god and every living creature of all flesh that is on this earth is what the rainbow represents and that's yeah. what he's trying to take back and uh, use it for he says the rainbow stands as a poignant reminder that god keeps his promises despite the wickedness in the world god has sent another global flood to dest- God has not sent another global flood to destroy all flesh. Right, and I like what, Oh, and thank him for that. Right, I like what Meta said. He said, so the rainbow is a little reminder from God that he hasn't slaughtered us yet. Because if you love someone, you have to constantly threaten them. That's right. I love you, and that's why I don't stab you with this knife. Right, and here's the, <laughs> and here's the symbol. But, you know, I, I went to the website. I went to AIG, and I, got, I found this little nuggy, and it says, interestingly, if the flood of Noah's day was just a local flood, Like many Christians sadly believe and teach, God has broken his promises time and time again. Since the time of Noah, there have been numerous local floods, some of them very devastating to human and animal life. But there's never been another global flood because God keeps his promises. Now, there will be another global judgment, but it will be by fire next time. 2 Peter 3.10, as outlined below. And then he goes into scary land, which I thought, I said, you know, Here's the situation again. He could have very easily during the Christmas holiday could have very easily have simply said, hey, we're putting a spectrum of color on this. It's a beautiful rainbow. It's part of the story. But instead he said, well, we're going to go and we're doing this specifically to get back at those gay people because that has a lot to do with his creationist story. And then he goes and and he says, well, this isn't enough to talk about this, but we're actually going to use this as an opportunity to bring up hell. Well, because it's all connected. Because it's scary land, and that's the the next one. I'm like, this guy, Merry Christmas to you, guy. Yes. Goodness gracious. Then he says this. This adds more scary. 
knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Jeez. And then compares it to the days of Noah, which is why it plays in. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This is all wrapped up. This whole rainbow thing for him on around Christmas is all wrapped up not only in, in again, poking the daylights out of gay people's eyeballs, but also to to make a point about the end times, his yes. apocalyptic predictions about the end of the world. Well, and I I have to take this opportunity to just say it, and I know it's uh, the day after Christmas and all, but this this God that they're talking about is one vicious sucker. He's one vicious dude. the The idea of I can slaughter the entire masses, and since I won't, you owe me. And I, it's just a, it's a cynical way of looking at the world. It's a very actual scary way. But you know what? I think that people that have the idea of a deity that is all nice, all you know, sugars and spice and everything nice, they don't really look at the natural world very often. Because I mean, at least when the, this is something you have to throw a bone to the p- people of two thousand years ago when they were writing this, they did notice that God is mean because the earth is pretty mean or indifferent. Bad things happen a lot, and a lot, a lot of times it's happening enough where you can assume that the God is actually kind of an a hole. He's kind of a jerk. And that's when you get the God slaughters everybody through the flood. Because, I mean, the Greeks had this too. The, the Greeks definitely understood the idea that if this deity is real, it's a mean one. So did the Jews. So did the early Christians, in fact. It would be – it's kind of an interesting modern novelty, the idea that, you know, Jesus is this real mush thing. Real, real hippie real Jesus. Real mush kush. Real Hi- hippie Jesus. Eastern, Eastern Jesus. And I would, you know, I'd be interested to hear what our listeners have to say, 616-656-1680. But, you know, I kind of think that maybe it has to do with uh, the kind of the turn of the century, industrialism, uh, more conversation amongst uh, different countries. I think that's that's part of the reason yeah. for that. I think, too, I think, too, just that people are becoming more connected where we are – as a society, you can argue that people are unhappier or they feel less less connected in that sense, but people are less violent than they've ever been. It is much even with what's going on right now, violence is not is not up. Um, and I think that that's that's another reason why is because our behavior is nicer towards each other, and therefore even our deities become nicer because we're creating the whole thing. They are, and you look back and there's a great book. Actually, and I'm trying to remember, uh, Robert Wright, uh, who wrote it, Robert Wright, and I encourage people to go check it out. It's called The Evolution of God, and it's a really interesting take on it. I don't – I wouldn't agree entirely with everything he has to say. I don't know anybody that I do, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I qualify it every time uh, Mm -hmm. to say it that way. But he he goes through and he talks about how the society that you live in, the cultural setting around you. The impact that that has on on theology and on ecclesiology, like what, what's the construct of your religious organization? It kind of depends. It depends on what's going on around you, you know. And so, and the the evolution of that in time, and when when different people groups came together, what happened when their gods were a little bit different, but kind of the same, and the fusionism that often took place, the wars. It's the evolution of God. You got to check it out, Robert Wright. When we get back, we might talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yes, we can talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson saying that the universe just may be a simulation. Stick around, folks. 95.3 FM, 1680 AM. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them. 
You hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Welcome back to Paleo Radio. And JB, Avril Levine made news a little bit ago. Uh, she totally did, man. And I, I saw it, and right away, Joe, I knew it was something we had to talk about. It's right over here by Chris Mensch. And I encourage you, go check him out on Twitter at Chris underscore Mensch. That's M E N C H. And you can find uh, his work over at Complex.com. Avril Levine calls out Mark Zuckerberg for bullying Nickelback. Apparently, <laughs> Avril was not very pleased with the joke that Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg made at the expense of Nickelback. And so naturally, she decided to take her anger to Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Tweet storm. She, and, you know, but she was married before to the former frontman, uh, Chad. Oh, I didn't even know that. That's the whole thing. I was like, yeah kind of diminishes her apologetic. A little bit. It kind of does. I, I guess the other part that diminishes it is that she's talking about Nickelback. Yes. And that actually makes it so that her argument... <laughs> it's, it weakens it. It weakens it. it. It's kind of like, well, yeah, I mean, you don't want to make fun of a band and say they've never sold anything or they're no good. There's no good Nickelback songs. That's what Mark Zuckerberg said. Mm-hmm. So we have drama in the 1% here. But So she went back and said... Many people use your products. Some people love them and some people don't. Either way, you're allowed your musical opinion. However, your jab at Nickelback is in poor taste. When you have a voice like yours, you may want to consider being more responsible with, promote, with promoting bullying, especially given what's going on in the world today. Hashtag say no to bullying. Hashtag, hashtag the joke is old. Hashtag Nickelback has sold over 50 million albums. That's mm. the long. That's a long hashtag. But fifty million albums. I mean, yeah. Hey, that's right. Yeah. What was it? It was it Kenneth, Kenneth uh, Young, or what was the name? The guy that would sing um, Ricky Martin. She bangs. She bangs. Mm-hmm. Oh baby, well she moves. I think he sold a ton too, and he yeah. sucks. Yeah, I was gonna say you can actually be a best-selling, you know, an author or a best, you know, best-selling musician with gold records and everything else, and your stuff is literally garbage. Master P, Just- Master P <laughs> is a very decorated rapper. He's not very right. good. He's actually, right? yeah, real terrible. It is the but way yeah, it is. Sorry, Avril Master P. Levine, yeah, and so I don't, I don't really know about about that whole situation. But I'll tell you another one. I don't really know much about Joe. I don't know what to do with this. Is uh, old uh, T Bear. Yeah. Old Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yep. Yeah, he thinks that there's a very high chance the universe is just a simulation. Yes, and I, I, I actually have some contention with it. I, some, I, I am going to use the same arguments that most scientists use against the existence of God, and I'm going to ask that the theory that we live in a simulation be held up to the same standard for proof and evidence. Um, but it is an interesting article, and it is well noted that he was not – it was not an agreement at the uh, at the uh, memorial debate that he was at, the Isaac Asimov uh, 2016 memorial debate. Mm-hmm. It was not an agreement, what he said, with the panel. They uh, wide disagreements uh, throughout. And this was held at the American Museum of Natural History. Yes. So the, it was a great, uh, a great forum. And it says, um, depending on whether you want to really – whether or not you want reality to be real or not is kind of an interesting sentence. But depending on whether you want reality to be real or not, the answers from some panelists may be more comforting than the responses from others. Physicist Lisa Randall, for example, said that she thought the odds of the universe not being real are so low that it would be effectively zero. Yeah. But astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is hosting the debate, said he thinks the likelihood for the universe being a simulation – May be very high, and he's right up there with with scient, uh, scientist Mike Cernovich. With Cernovich, yeah, because <laughs> yep. yeah, Cernovich, Cernovich believes that uh, that we're in a simulation, mm-hmm. or it's a, or that it's a hologram. I, I get well, yeah. That brings up the Matrix yeah. stuff. Now, hey, look, there are the odd things that is like what we consider to be touch is not actually touch. That your atoms never actually touch the atoms of something else. So when my hand sits on the desk, the atoms in my hand are actually not touching the atoms on the desk. There is a slight area of separation. And the electromagnetic connectivity of my fingers is how I feel it. But it's not actually touching. There is that sort of trippy stuff, right? But at the same time, you need to have some serious, serious proof that this is all fake. To say it's fake. I mean, and... It gets into, and this is what 
is my bigger concern is the same argument where people will say, well, something had to have created everything. God created it because it can't all come from nothing. Your next question is who created God? And that's that. Yeah, we have no that he's always been here. Right. But that's the rabbit hole. That's the rabbit hole that you get in with, yeah. with the simulation. They're too. rolling out the red carpet and then saying, don't go in. Yeah. That's weird. Well, and it's also going, um, imag- to me, it's the Matrix. You, Matrix is, is a great example of this where people are saying that it's all fake, right? It's mm-hmm. all pretend and there's a world within a r- world. Well, imagine if uh, Nino, uh, Nemo took his... Nemo. Nemo took... I can't Nemo. remember which one, the red or blue Nemo. pill. That's going to go down forever, Joe. Yep. Nemo. It's N- Neo. Neo. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> Finding Nemo. Thank you. Finding Nemo. Find, hey, that's kind of like the Matrix. A little bit. You got to no. find Neo. <laughs> when, Finding Neo. When that's Neo took do. the uh, the pill and he wakes up, what if then yeah. they come up to him and they go, this is fake. Here's another red and red and blue pill. And he takes it and he wakes up and they come up to him and they go, this is fake. What about another red or blue pill? And it, how do you know that it's not always a simulation within the, a simulation within a simulation? The New World Order, Joe, is already prepping the masses for this. Uh, they're, already, <laughs> they're already doing it with these psyops with Hollywood. Ask Jay Dyer. Uh, he's, I think he's written a book about this. But talking about the Matrix, for one, that kind of prepped humanity for the idea uh, that we're actually not here. We're in another place mm. in human farms uh, and all of that. And then Inception. And those two put together uh, where you go into the matrix, but then you find out that it's a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream that goes forever. Mm -hmm. And it just – it goes deeper and every single time they go, here's another pill. Do you want to take it? And you're in that – it's kind of like Groundhog Day. Yeah, it is. Ad (laughs) infinitum. It is. It just goes forever. And I guess the thing you have to think about is quality of life. Mm. Really where you say if it all is a simulation – but there are actual rules that govern this universe that we know are real. I mean, even if this is a simulation, the simulation has really locked down this whole thing with gravity. I mean, it's pretty consistent, right? Um, is life better lived uh, looking at it from a naturalist point of view anyway and saying that even though it's a simulation, it's better to look at things as they naturally occur and use that as evidence no matter what, whether that's true or not? That if the if the universe is governed by certain laws, you still apply to those. And it kind of makes me wonder. And I, you know, when Matrix first came out, I think I went and saw it in the movie theater like forty seven times. And <laughs> when I I was I was a fanatic freak uh, about the movie. But I, it it hit me, and I thought they they gloss over this detail about the the first person who discovers Zion, and that he realized it was a Matrix. But how did he escape? For one, how did he even discover if he's a simulation, if he's a program, how did he how did out? how is he autonomous enough to be like, what's the program trying to do? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean so unless the program even does that, you know, but then to sit there and say, once you realize that's the case, how does he connect with people in Zion? How does he connect with his body in the in the in the farm of people that they had there with all the the bots all over the place. So you sit there and you say, how did he escape? And then if you remember uh, Neo, when he was uh, pulled out of it, all the wires get pulled out of his body. He gets flushed down that tube, down into this weird looking dump water area. He's naked mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to escape. And they uh, grab him and pull him out and pull him up into the spaceship. You sit there and you say, how did the first guy do that? Yeah. It all is depending on the first guy. It is. So the same question applies here. And and basically Neil deGrasse Tyson and others think that they would be the first guy. And which is yeah. weird because as the article states, most physicists and philosophers agree that it's impossible to prove definitively that we don't live in a simulation and that the universe is real. That's right. <laughs> and Tyson does agree, but he says that he wouldn't be surprised if we were to find out somehow that someone else is responsible for our universe. Now, this is the open door that people always go, well, it's a god. And actually what he's saying is that the likelihood of intelligence being only on this planet is so small that there could be something that was ahead of us that created it in a simulation. It's still – it's very, very um, – it's it's a lot of postulation, too much postulation for me to be comfortable with. And it kind of – doesn't it almost sound a little bit – and I hate doing this, man. It's just so bad because I love, I love you, Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> you are – you're amazing. My daughter thought you had the, the best mustache on television. Mm-hmm. Okay, You're part of my, my speech at the solstice. I love you. But 
when I when I hear this, when he says, and if that's the case, it's easy for me to imagine that everything in our lives is just the creation of some other entity for their entertainment. I'm saying the day we learn that it is true, I will be the only one in the room saying I'm not surprised. And I thought, I said, that reminded me, I hearkened back, Joe, to a meme you shared on Paleo Radio of a guy walking into a lab with scientists and he discovered the answer and it's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Right, it's kind of the it's kind of the the analogy where or the storyline where people say that scientists are working their way up a mountain, and when they get there, there's a, a, there's, a guru at the top that's like, "Yeah, I'm finally that's glad the, you're here." You that's know, it's the like, Dinesh D'Souza. And <laughs> yeah, stuff. and it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. It is, you know? and I said, "Boy, it just it." Neil would be the guy coming in the room saying that. And I, yep. Listen, if he disagrees with that, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Reach out to him. Tell him to reach out to us. We'd love to talk to him. And you can find that at Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. That's right. And he did say, too, is <laughs> yeah. one of the main arguments that physicists use to talk about what's known as the simulation hypothesis is that we can prove that it's possible to simulate a universe if we can figure out all the laws that govern it and how everything works. And physicists are trying to do that. And it makes it much more likely that it could actually be simulated. Well, that makes sense. Now, once we understand how something works, we can run a simulation on it. It's kind of like climate change. The more we're understanding about it, the more accurate our simulations are running, right? But at the same time, it's something that they do need to look into, but it requires extraordinary evidence because it's an extraordinary claim. And that's something that I just cannot go and get wild with. Uh, speaking about Wild Joe, we're done with the first hour of the show. It's totally amazing. Yes, You're going to want to stick around, everybody. We're going to be back for another hour of Paleo Radio Show. The number is 616-656-1680. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You've been listening to Paleo Radio exclusively with Secular Media Group. You are now entering Paleo Radio. We literally just walked out the door to walk right back in. Yes, out and in. <laughs> out and in. We're right back. Uh, for legal reasons, FCC, we do that at the top of the hour. We're glad to be back. You're listening to Paleo Radio Show, a national and even international program, Joe. We are international. We are international. And in fact, we want to give a big shout out to some followers in Portland. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we Portland, Oregon is our actual number one city for listening. Uh, we have the most listeners out of Oregon. We also have some uh, listeners in Texas. We have listeners in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Uh, we have listeners all the way over in uh, Pensacola, Florida. Do we have any in Kansas? I we will have to check our demographics, we're but I think need, we do. Yeah, I think so. We're going to need to find out how many states we're in right now. How many different places we have paleocrats that are just begging. Uh, for new episodes and new material all the time. All right, number 616-656-1680 if you would like to call. We've talked about what's been going on in Berlin uh, and their response to terror. We're talk- we've talked about the rainbow over at the Ark Encounter. And we've also talked about Neil deGrasse Tyson and his simulation theory. Yes. His idea, right, mm-hmm. that we may-, we may be living in a simulation. You're welcome to call. Uh, we also, you know, we, we did a, a question last week, Joe, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, we did. We did. And I was thinking last night, I shared this thing, and I, you know, uh, it might be a fun one. I brought a sticker in case we want to do this. But um, there's, there is a uh, picture on Paleo Radio's Facebook page, facebook.com slash paleo radio. If you can go and find out what's in that picture, then why it would be special to this show. And you call the show and identify what's in the picture by brand name, then you would win a, a magnet and a sticker. Yes. It is me in front of a television. Okay. It's the only hint I'm going to give you. The, it's a picture. It's a meme. It says, do you see what I see? Okay. So it's, it's mm-hmm. really fun. But you go check it out. Find out what it is. Find out the, the, the name of it. 
Identify it. Give us a call, 616-656-1680. And uh, you can win a WPRR sticker as well as a Team Tiny Dancer decal. That's right. You can get stickers, decals. You can also get a WPRR magnet, which would be just all sorts of fun and just a wonderful thing. But first, we're going to get into... The when and why nationalism beats globalism and the question of is nationalism rising or populism rising and how moral psychology can help explain and reduce tensions between the two. This is by Jonathan Haidt Mm -hmm. and the American Interest. You know, I was pumped about this, obviously, Joe. Oh, yeah. He's our boy. Uh, Yeah. And we have not. We've mentioned Jonathan Haidt many, many times. On the show, we've encouraged people to go read his book or to go check out his TED Talks and different things, but we've never actually – Referenced any of his actual works. I don't know if we've ever actually quoted Jonathan Haidt. I don't know if we've quoted him, but we have referenced, we've ref- a we've referenced great many him, of his work. A great many of his work. But this is actually a time where we're going to just talk about this. And I thought it was interesting because it's so poignant. It's so relevant to our situation here in the United States. And it's called When and Why Nationalism Beats Globalism uh, and How Moral Psychology Can Help Explain and Reduce Tensions Between the Two. It's over at the American interest. And he begins by saying, what on earth is going on in the Western democracies? From the rise of Donald Trump in the United States and an assortment of right-wing parties across Europe uh, through the June 23rd Brexit vote, many on the left have the sense that something dangerous and ugly is spreading. Right-wing populism seen as the Zika virus of politics. And actually, aside from the jab, you know, I mean, maybe maybe that's not even sensationalistic to say the Zika virus of of politics Mm -hmm. that many on the left view it that way. But that's even something that we mentioned earlier on the show is the rise of this and Mm -hmm. that it's viewed even by us as a troublesome thing. He's talking about me because I view it as a troublesome (laughs) thing. Right. Yes, I still do. So he says that most uh, most analysis on this published since Brexit vote focuses on economic factors. Of this kind of left behind thesis. And we all know what that is. You know, you, you, especially in the United States, we're here in Michigan broadcasting out of Grand Rapids. A lot of people in Michigan uh, know that narrative very well, where they say uh, we're not, there were a lot of less educated, not very well educated individuals, but they were in a very rich country. There was a lot of opportunity and you could do work, in fact, menial work in many ways. You could do that and still make a good living. You could have health care. You could, uh, send your kids to school. You had a nice job. You had representation mm-hmm. at your work. And that you could do it like uh, my relatives. I have relatives that had high-paying union jobs, retired from them, have great livings. Um, and they did it with like a seventh-grade education. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm talking great grandparents yes. and grandparents and yeah. things like that. But that was true, and it was true for them, uh, and that that's gone. Right? Yes. That we've seen that through trends, whether inevitable or not. We've seen it through a couple decades now at least of these trends that have gone in this direction with uh, free trade, outsourcing, offshoring, you name it, technology, travel, immigration, all these things. So that is kind of the the driving thesis. But he goes and tries to lay it out differently and he lays it out in four pieces, uh, four chapters. And he starts with the rise of the globalists. He says, as nations grow prosperous – and I thought of you, Joe, with this because this is something you've said – As nations grow prosperous, their values change in predictable ways. The most detailed longitudinal longitudinal research on these changes comes from the World Values Survey. And it's interesting. I'll let you uh, read it for yourself, the the article. Uh, You can find the link on our website. If we zoom out far enough from these studies, right, we find these trends that can emerge from the data. Countries seem to move in two directions, along two axes. First, As they industrialize, they move away from traditional values in which religion, ritual, and deference to authorities are important and toward secular rational values that are more open to change, progress, and social engineering based on rational considerations. Yes, which I I mean, I think that that is kind of the – it's the nature. It's something when – it's the nature of a country in its infancy growing into being an industrialized nation. Um, Secondly, Haidt adds to it and he says – as they grow wealthier, more citizens move into service sectors, uh, and nations move away from survival values, emphasizing the economic and physical security found in one's family, tribe, or other parochial groups. Towards self-expression or emancipative values that emphasize individual rights and protections, ju- not just for oneself, but as a matter of principle for everyone. You know, I was thinking about this before I even read this article, just even within the last week or so. Um, I've been thinking about this and thinking 
about how people in their, their calculus regarding marriage and arrangements of that nature, how it's changed Be, and, and how kids staying close to home, mm-hmm. how that's no longer – that doesn't happen that's as much. Not, that doesn't happen as much. You can travel now. And what that does when you're no longer in that, in that mindset where every locale is in the mindset of it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that changes because you're getting it mixed up with travel and with communication and social media and you name it. And so these, these religious underpinnings that provided unity are no longer – they're not, no longer viewed the same, and you can even see this with a stark example would be uh, the diminishment or the entirely getting rid of a parish system mm-hmm. where Catholics don't have to go anymore to the church up the road. No. That used, to, that used to actually serve a purpose. Like that served a purpose of keeping communities together. You knew your neighbors. You, you, yep. get, you know your priest. There was predictability and order uh, to that construct, and that uh, – you know they say, well, it's a, it, you should – you don't have to. I mean, they're not going to deny you communion because you're going to a different parish church. That's right. You know, and so you see that even even with that. But as they grow wealthier, they move away from survival values because that's not as is as big of a role in your life. You don't go hunting as you don't often worry about anymore it. No. for your food. Your hunting requires you to go to the convenience store. Yes. Right? Heaven forbid that, but it's true. Don't do that. It's actually the worst. But it is food. what people do. <laughs> but it's what people do. It's literally should, the worst, but don't do that. You should not be eating where you get yeah. your gas. Yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> that's a good rule to follow, proverbially. Yes. It's just true. It's wise. Yes. But it it's, but that's the case that you move away from that and you become more individualistic. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a natural thing, especially when you don't have to rely on Having the hunter mentality, you don't have to go out into the woods to go get your food anymore. The survival values just no longer take the front seat because they're not they're not a highly valued thing anymore. You take it for granted. Christian Welzel has a very enlightening book called Freedom Rising, and in that he says, "...fading existential pressures, i.e. threats and challenges to survival, open people's minds, making them prioritize freedom over security, autonomy over authority, diversity over uniformity, and creativity over discipline." By the same token, persistent existential pressures keep people's minds closed, in which case they emphasize the opposite priorities. They, the, as, I'm sorry, the as essentially relieved state of mind is the source of tolerance and solidarity behind one's in-group. The as existentially stressed state of mind is the source of discrimination and hostility against out-groups. So it works two different ways. Basically, if you see existential threats, you can view them two different ways. If you have the survival technique of that, you're seeing that as an in-group. It's us versus them, and it's a very small group. But once it gets a little bit bigger, you look at your in-group towards out-groups, and the way you feel about what's coming from the outside is perceived as a little bit different. I like this. The existentially relieved state of mind is the source of tolerance and solidarity beyond one's in-group. So, so if you... Extending the hand. Yes. So if you have a relieved state of mind, right, you're not in a fearful state. You're not scared. You're, in, you're relieved. You're, you find commonality. You find things that you share in common. That, that is where you, you see the roots take place in, in things like tolerance and solidarity. The existentially stressed state of mind, so freak out land, almost anybody who's, who's programmed every day to mainstream media totally freaked out of their mind, mm-hmm. right? That, that's the source of discrimination and hostility against outgroups. Because they're scared out of their minds. Yes. And it's also like when we were talking about in our earlier segment, the freedom over security worry, I think, wraps itself up very nicely with this. Where you say when you have people in the as existentially stressed mind, that's that's going to produce really bad behaviors later on in, in the group. And I think that that's what we're seeing happening in Europe. Now, Jonathan Haidt has some different opinions on that too, but it is something that I think there's a legitimate concern for. Well, and like – and let me get this – let me get this cat bell off of me, Joe. I hate doing this, but man, <laughs> I, I've been – we've been on the show now for just over an hour and a couple times I've had to get up in the show. And I've got this little bell that my son gave me that he wrapped around my neck earlier this morning. You can hear it, but it basically lets people know where I am all the time. Yes. And so for the sake of – Makes me think of uh, uh, Aesop's of fables, but we'll tell that on another day. <laughs> for the sake of security and privacy, I'm taking off that cat bell. All right. Yes. So, But I was thinking about this in terms of movies. Mm-hmm. And, oh, and yeah. And thinking, you know, how, how focused am I 
in my own life existentially when I'm not in survival mode and I'm able to just very freely just live the kind of life that says, I'm going to go to the movies today surrounded by people. I'm going to go to a concert, a symphony. I'm going to go to a mall or a ballet. I'm going to go to a circus with clowns, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not terrified out of my, <laughs> out of my mind, maybe a little scared. Right? Yes. Clowns, I'm not the biggest fan. But, the, you know, the Internet, you, you have this, this uh, life where you're not focused so much on the day-to-day needs of man. We need to get this or else we're hosed. You still have that. Everybody still has day-to-day needs. That's mm-hmm. part of it. But the role that that plays for survival, just, just brute, uh, raw survival mode, uh, is diminished the richer you get. Yes. The more prosperous you become. It's just, it's just true. It creates, according to the article, and I agree with this, creates a more cosmopolitan society or uh, citizen of the world, which is what it means. Yeah. And so the, the uh, article hints to John Lennon and his, uh, his song Imagine, right, to give an idea of the liberal universalism that's characterized elements of the globalist left in many Western nations and for several decades, you can think about his song Imagine. Um, just a quick quote from it. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope one day you'll join us and the world will be as one. So that, that yeah. gives – that is – I mean this is basically sacrilege and treason for nationalists. Well, that's – you know, and we say this – on the show, we say different strokes, different folks. That's kind of a realist take on things. Mm-hmm. That's an extreme version of that, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Different strokes. That would be more like one person's orthodoxy or one person's dogma is another person's heresy, mm-hmm. right? So one person says, man, that's required, and if you don't believe that, you're hosed. And another person says, you are forbidden entirely of believing that, and if you believe that, you're hosed. That is this. Yeah. With, with nationalists and with globalists, right? Because yes. you have these two takes that look at that, those words, those lyrics – Two totally different positions. Well, and they, yeah, they would be very, very opposed. The idea of no countries, no borders. Yeah. That's what it's saying. You and know, no religion. No religion. Yes. I mean, a lot of people f- have their identity wrapped up in their nationality and their religion. I mean, they, yeah. a lot of their identity is found there. And we're going to talk about that because we're going to wrap up this story. And we've got tons of stuff. We invite you to give us a call and talk about Christmas stories. But also, remember, go back on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash paleo radio find the meme uh where i look super surprised and there is a secret right you have to do a little treasure hunting and you can look inside that picture and if you find what's in that picture that's relevant to this show right why it's so unique and so special of a find if you call 616-656-1680 and you've got the right you've got the right answer if you have that you get a magnet for WPRR 95.3 FM, where we're broadcasting from. Best magnet ever. Best magnet ever. You're going to get all your dreams are going to come true. But you're also going to get a Team Tiny Dancer decal. Yes. So stick around, folks. We're going to co- cover this again when we come back, just for a couple more minutes. But stick around. Love we will be Paleo back. Radio, 95.3 FM. The club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleoradio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, Paleo Radio, the show that is just airing all over the United States right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, welcome back to listening to the show. We've been chatting about a bunch of different things, but you wanted to say something about the friendly atheist. I, not or, the no. friendly atheist. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. I want to talk to my brother. Oh, that's my, right. Your brother. I want to talk to my younger brother right now. <laughs> Uh, TJ, oh, the amazing atheist. I, you know, I go over and check him out every once in a while. He doesn't call. He doesn't text. He won't respond to any of my tweets. He won't he's even busy, come on the show. Guy. He won't go on Maury. No, like he's not even doing it. But I, I, I feel at this point that he knows all of this is going on, and he's just shoving it in his older brother's face because he he goes back and he's starting this new thing, right? Where what he's doing is he's going and he's watching movies. And he's sitting down in front of them. He gives a synopsis. Then he watches them and they laugh and it shows the uh, conversation that goes on. And then at the end, they wrap it up. And I thought, you know, this is kind of a, a cheap ripoff of stuff that was done by Paleo Cheese. And you can find that, P-A-L-E-O-C-H-E-E-Z-E, where they did fantastic uh, 
fantastic uh, reviews of, of big hits like Laser Blast, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, Italian Spider-Man, and the one that never made it to the big screen, Black Dynamite. That's right. Yeah, Italian and Spider-Man's fantastic. You got to go watch them. They're available on YouTube, Paleo Cheese. You just look up Laser Blast movie review. You're going to find it. But I sat there and I said, you know, <sighs> people always say, boy, you know, you look like Amazing Atheist. Boy, you guys do the same thing. And I said, he's always ripping off my stuff. Yeah, he's just taking he's your always, stuff. He's always ripping me off. <laughs> That's great. He's going to come on here, Joe. He will one day. You will come on and he'll here, become TJ. The fi- he'll, he will admit that he is your brother. Yes. You're going to go on Maury, TJ. That's right. I've got your number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Uh. So continuing the conversation, we've been talking about globalism versus nationalism. Jonathan Haidt, yeah. he broke it down into four chapters. The first one that we already have covered was the rise of globalists. Now, the second chapter that he gets into is that Globalists and nationalists grow further apart on immigration. Surprise, yeah. surprise. Nationalists see pa- patriotism as a virtue. They think their country and its culture are unique and worth uh, preserving. So obviously so. This is a real moral commitment, not oppose or cover up uh, er, not oppose or cover up racist bigotry. Now there are people he explains that there are people who do that. He yes. says there are yes, and he I, I don't have that in the notes, but he talks about that and he boils it down and says your love, you love your spouse because she or he is yours, not because you think your spouse is superior to all others. I think it's kind of a both and, maybe. Yeah, I, I think like, I think in our country yeah. though that's not the case. I think American exceptionalism is a out and out true belief that most people hold. If you ask people, "Is America the greatest country in the world?" Even though we don't rank number one on almost anything, they'll say yes, without a doubt. We are. I mean, unequivocally, we we are the best ever because American exceptionalism plays a uh, heavy role in that, too. I also think other countries feel that way, too. If you go into Germany, you ask them the best country in the world, a lot of them will say Germany. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's very normal. Yeah, nationalism breeds it. Yes. You know, having a shared sense of identity, norms, and history generally promote trust. Having no such shared sense leads to the condition that the sociologist Durkheim described as anomie or normal uh, normalistness. And he talks about, you know, it takes societies where you do have uh, high trust or high social capital, right? He talks about what does, it, what does it produce? He says lower crime rates, lower transaction costs for business, higher levels of prosperity, and a propensity toward generosity, among others. But that's because it's in-group. Yeah. That's describing the in-group. So, yes, there is, there is a benefit, right, to, to a, a stronger sense of collectivism. Yeah, there is. Cultural collective. There is. Well, and that's why saying in-group is the real word is that's why when we talk about words like American, they matter a lot. Now, I don't want to deviate this into race too much, but when people say I'm an American and there just happens to be no real nomenclature for a European American, it's just an American American, that has a lot to say culturally and socially about what we consider to be an in-group or not. And what we a lot of problems we have in America is the acceptance of other people that are part of the in group and have been for the entirety of the nation's history that we don't seem to want to allow into the in group. I, albeit or i.e., black people. That yeah. that's that's a cultural thing that we in America struggle with. But it's it's not it's not the entire shebang. But that's what we were talking about when uh, Height says opposed to cover up race, racial bigotry, right. where. Um, Black people have been part of the in-group in America since the in-group's been here. Right? Yeah. Chapter 3, I thought – and you bring up racism and that's okay because racism is the very next thing. Chapter 3, Muslim immigration triggers the authoritarian alarm. Racism, says Haidt, is a shallow term when used as an explanation. It asserts that there are some people who just don't like anyone different from themselves, particularly if they have darker skin. They have no valid reason for this dislike. They just dislike difference. And that's all we need to know to understand their rage. But on closer inspection, racism usually turns out to be deeply bound up with moral concerns. And he uses that term moral in a really strict sense. He Mm -hmm. says he's using it in a purely descriptive sense to mean concerns that seem, for the people that we're discussing here, to be matters of good and evil. Uh, He's not saying that racism is in fact morally good or morally correct. Yes. But he's saying for them it's a moral concern. Yes, which right. I think is a great – it's a great way of explaining it because when people think of racism and they think of racism as just, oh, you don't like anything different, um, that's 
like, what's the best way to keep a racist a racist? Say that they're racist and say that's all you have to say to them. Yep, move on. Nothing else to that's, talk I about. I mean, really, how do, you, how do you fight racism with that sort of defense? <laughs> you don't. You yeah. actually inhibit it. You, you, you enable it, actually. You help it. You don't inhibit. You enable. You allow it to go on. But this is Height going back into it. He says, they hate people whom they perceive as having values that are incompatible with their own or who they believe engage in behaviors they find abhorrent or whom they perceive as to be a threat to something they hold dear. These moral concerns may be out of touch with reality, and they are routinely amplified by demagogues. But if we want to understand the recent rise of right-wing populist movements, then racism can't be the stopping point. It must be the beginning of the inquiry. I think that's a good point. It is. And I think that's what makes this article, I mean, for all, and we disagree with him on some of the stuff, Mm -hmm. but to say this is actually a, a, a really solid point that says, Look where we are now. Mm-hmm. Look at our situation. People, people are kind of ticked about 2016 in general. Like, I mean, you saw that last night. It was a lot mm-hmm. of this. I'm, we're done with it. Get it over with. It's over. But moving forward, we have years now ahead of Trump and of Trumpism. We have years ahead of the center left and the debate going on with uh, the progressive kind of Bernie Kratz and your more establishment oriented uh, DNC types. You're going to have that. How do we move forward uh, together to actually have these discussions? Because that also takes place between the center left and the progressive left is that debate over race. Mm -hmm. That's also part of it. You had that with Bernie where there was accusations about uh, the the race issue with him that he's Mm -hmm. either that he's not focused on or that maybe he's kind of a little racist. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that debate is there even on even on the left. So it's everywhere at this point. How do we as a country? Regardless of your position on the political or religious spectrum, how do we come together to figure out things that are actually important for all of us, that are actually yeah. essential to be done? Well, I, I don't know, and maybe this is bad for me to get this tinge, but I have to let it out. I don't think that – just with Donald Trump winning, to flip it over and say what can the liberals do to reach out more to conservatives I think is kind of a laughable thing. The problem is still with – the conservatives that for eight years bungled discourse and said they weren't willing to vote and help one person for any reason whatsoever. That's the biggest problem we have in politics. We have one group that that murders the discourse and then says that the system doesn't work. And it doesn't work because half of them are purposely killing the discourse. And that group is now in power, but not one, one iota closer to wanting di- better discourse. Not one iota. Mm. And And, hey, liberals are... Liberals are weaning down from that, but I'll tell you what, the biggest thing that affected discourse, it wasn't that Obama came in. It wasn't that race relations got worse. It was that one party decided that for eight years we will vote for nothing even if we agree with it. Uh, for this one person. And now now we're seeing that go the other way. And I don't want liberals to do the same thing. But at the same time, I'm not going to stop saying that Republicans need to be more open-handed themselves as well. I agree with that totally. You know, and I, I hope that for, for Trump, I hope that he is serious about some of the things that he said about working with Pelosi or working with people across the – I hope that that is happening to some degree. Yeah, I do too. I, but in this article, it says what should, what should be done? You know, should, we, should we simply end it by saying, well, you know, the, the Republicans did this, which is totally true. Should both sides be doing that same thing or should one side be doing the right thing even if the other side's doing the wrong thing? But he brings up a couple points. He says, pay attention to key, three key variables in the construct of this, the, the way it's laid out. The percentage of foreign-born residents at any given time, the degree of moral difference of each incoming group, and the degree of assimilation being achieved by each group's children. And I, I thought, you know, at first, it's kind of like uh, being tinged in the nose with, a, with a, an amber from a fire. Like you're kind of like, whoa, what? that's mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of hard. But then I thought about it and I said, you know, those are things that are talked about when, when debating immigration. When people talk about assimilation, that's actually something that is monitored. Yeah. How, how well are people assimilating? That's one yeah. of the arguments that people talking about increased immigration are using is saying if you look at certain, uh, certain groups, especially Hispanics, that you're seeing that second, third generation big time assimilation, language. Oh, culture, yeah. Even, of- even first, I mean, yeah. most. Most situations with uh, immigrants that are coming from Spanish-speaking countries, most of the time the person that gets here is not, and they're 
the children that they have in the country are all, I mean, almost always. It's very, very highly likely they're bilingual. I mean, they usually are the ones that do the the interpreting for the older people. Is they have the fourteen year old or the fifteen year old that speaks better English talk to the insurance agent. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, something that happens. But that's a great point too. Is the degree of assimilation being achieved in each group's children? That side question for you, and then we we're gonna have to get to our break here. But do you think that the problems that are going on in America have more to do with? the assimilation of people coming in, or the lack of holding the cultural values of the people that were already in it. For instance, like, I look at white youth and black youth, and I say, there's a bigger problem there than there is with immigrants. Yeah. Way bigger. We're, we're they, I mean, they don't, they don't assimilate to American culture very well, for what we call it American culture. They seem to not be very good at it. That, I mean, I see that as a bigger problem with our societal... Uh, societal problems is white youth and black youth together, I think, is a bigger issue than immigration. You know, I think that this article is useful in the way that we talk about useful articles in that uh, people can go, they can find the research, find the data, look it up, come to their own conclusions, balance the scales for themselves and figure out how to move forward and have reasonable discussions that are whether we like it or not. It's the same. It's. It's kind of like the situation with the refugees. It's not something that maybe certain people wanted, but it's a circumstance that is here Mm -hmm. that has to be dealt with, and people need to be Mm level-headed because the ramifications of of paranoia, the ramifications of hysteria, um, or of this kind of real sectarian, cultish, no negotiation with people who disagree with us, that's going to have ramifications that aren't just bad for us and for other countries, but transgenerationally. It's going to have consequences down the road. And I think if nothing else, we're looking down the barrel of a lot of bad consequences. We (laughs) We, are. Right now, we are. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to say, all right, uh, let's minimize that. I agree. And this is something to keep in the back pocket. This is what Height said that I think is very very true and something that people are not – they're not accounting for, especially on the conservative side, is um, status quo conservatives are not natural allies of authoritarians who often favor radical change and are willing to take big risks to implement untested policies. This is why so many Republicans and nearly all conservative intellectuals oppose Donald Trump. I, I mean that's why people that are saying that there's no middle ground, oh, yeah, there's middle ground. And I'm not saying just in not Donald Trump. I'm saying that – there have been people that are on the conservative aspect of politics in America that have recognized something that's happening that's moving faster than they'd like it, and they don't necessarily identify with it. And that group of people, they are still conservatives. They still believe in the same processes. 616-656-1680. Two people have already tried to identify what's in the picture. The hint is it's not a Theracane. 616-656-1680. We'll be right back. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. All right, Joe. We've had two people make an attempt to win the WPRR Magnet and the Team Tiny Dancer decal. And I've been notified by sources close uh, to Team Tiny Dancer that this is the last decal available. That we have for now. Yes, that we have for now. We're going to have to get more decals. We're going to have to get more shirts. We're going to get more Paleo Radio shirts. Yes. Because those things, Joe... Those things are going like hotcakes. They flew off the shelves. They flew off the shelves. We, we no longer, I think we're entirely out of extra larges. All right. I think we've got some uh, mediums and smalls. So uh, if there's any ladies or uh, genteel dudes uh, that would, would enjoy a small or a medium, you're welcome to do that. As well as for kids. Kids love the shirts, and we always encourage people to take a picture with your Paleo Radio shirt on and share it with us on social media at Twitter at Paleo Radio Show. Or at Facebook at Facebook.com slash Paleo Radio. Yes. Yeah, great point. So now we're getting into Christmas. We just enjoyed the holiday, but we want to talk about Americans and when they banned Christmas and who actually did it. It's an interesting article. Yeah, and but I gotta say this before we move on. Yeah. Before we move on, I'm sorry. But but if you would like to take part in this competition. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. yeah, we have to do this. If you if you want to take part in this competition, I'm gonna make it a little easier for you. I'm gonna give you some hints. All right, so you don't even have to go to our Facebook page to find this picture, but you still have to think and don't cheat. What is the brand 
of the back massager that is seen in a commercial during the BBC airing of Doctor Who's Christmas episode. The picture is there. There's only a couple. And I'll give you a hint because it's a self-massager. So it's not an mm-hmm. electrical one. Yes. And it's not the Theracane. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's not, not the it, Theracane. It's not a Theracane. Theracane, uh, that's the green one that uh, I have here. And for people who know the show, man, we, we have pictures. Green ones, blue ones, yes. There's we all. have green ones. we got blue ones. There's all different color back massagers that we've got here. That's why we're so smooth and chill like Hindu all cows the time. here is because we're constantly massaging ourselves. And yeah. so, yeah, constantly. And so <laughs> it's, it's, it's like an extension of our bodies at this point. <laughs> and so, but it is blue. It's got two handles on it. Okay, so it's a blue self back massager, and it has two handles on it, and it's kind of shaped in the shape of an S. If you can identify what that is, and it's not a Theracane, and you call 616-656-1680 within the next 20 minutes with the proper answer or the closest approximation, you are going to get a magnet for WPRR, Public Reality Radio, and the very last Team Tiny Dancer decal that we currently have. Isn't that the good stuff? 616-656-1680. All right. So, Americans Banned Christmas, and this is by the week staff. So, when Americans Banned Christmas, it says, how did the first settlers celebrate Christmas? Well, they didn't. This is in America. The pilgrims who came to America in 1620 were strict Puritans with firm views on religious holidays such as Christmas and Easter. Mm -hmm. Scripture did not name any holidays except Sabbath, they argued, and the very concept of holy days implied that some days were not holy. Quote, they for whom all days are holy can give no holiday, was a common Puritan maxim. Puritans were particularly contemptuous of Christmas, nicknaming it Foolstide, and banning their flock from any celebration of it throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. That was news to me. Me too. It was news to me. And I listen, I know some people, Joe, who don't celebrate it. Yeah. Some some Christians. I know Christians who do not celebrate uh, Christmas for theological reasons. Some of those cited here, they're more in the uh, puritanical school of thought. Although they're fundamentalist independent Baptists, so not necessarily very puritanical very in, the, Puritan, in the historical yeah. sense. Yes. right? I mean, they're, they're a little bit different, obviously. Uh, but they don't celebrate Christmas. They don't celebrate Easter. They don't celebrate any of these religious holidays. Yes. Yeah, so I know people. But I didn't realize that... that People in the United States up through the 17th and 18th century that that, that wasn't that, happening. That wasn't happening. I had no idea. So on the first December 25th, the settlers spent uh, the first one that they spent in Plymouth Colony. They worked in the fields as they would any other day. Mm. The next year, a group of non-Puritan workmen caught celebrating Christmas. Oh, they were caught celebrating Christmas with a game of stool ball, which is an early precursor to baseball. And they were punished by Governor William Bradford. My conscience cannot let you play, he told them, while everybody else is out working. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, small government. Yes. Back in the old days. Very, very small <laughs> very, government. You're not allowed to play small. baseball today. You're playing stool ball <laughs> yeah. on Christmas? Other people we are can't, working? can't allow none of that stool ball to be played. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So we got to play stool ball. Though. Yeah, we, we have, to, look we up have the rules. to find out what the rules yeah. to stool ball are, yeah. without a doubt. So why did Puritans like Christmas? They did, They had several reasons, including – or why didn't they like Christmas? I'm sorry. They had several reasons, including the fact that it didn't originate as the Christian holiday. The upper classes in ancient Rome celebrated December 25th as the birthday of the sun god Mithra. The date fell right in the middle of Saturn, uh, Saturnalia, a month-long holiday dedicated to food, drink, and revelry. The Pope Julius I is said to have chosen the day to celebrate Christ's birth as a way of co-opting the pagan rituals. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, the Puritans considered it historically inaccurate to place the Messiah's arrival on December 25th. They thought Jesus had not been or had been born sometime in September. Yeah. So they they didn't like it for a whole bunch of reasons, and apparently. Back in the day, Saturnalia was quite a, a swag big, party. That's a big deal. Yeah, it was hopping. Yeah. It was totally hopping. Food, drink, revelry. Uh, yeah. In fact, six, the 6th century clergyman, Hugh Latimer, said, Men dishonor Christ more in the 12 days of Christmas than in all the 12 months besides. And Cotton Mather, New England's most influential religious leader, told his flock in 1712 that, quote, the feast of Christ's nativity is spent in reveling, dicing, carding, masking, and in all licentious liberty, by <laughs> mad mirth, by long eating, by hard drinking, by lewd gaming, 
by rude reveling. Ooh, and I thought I thought about it. I was like dicing, dicing. They're they're playing. They're <laughs> you're they're, dicing. They're bro. throwing those bones. Yeah, they're throwing the bones. They're they're carding. Yeah, it's like, dude, you're playing euchre. You're playing cards. You're masking. You're playing Uno and yeah. Skippo. Yeah, <laughs> not sure how that goes, but it, they didn't like it. You know, and they said they they didn't want their people their people doing that as late as what seventeen twelve. Let's go right now. We have a caller who claims to have the answer, Joe, to our to our uh, question regarding the self back massager that was seen in a commercial during the BBC America airing of Doctor Who's Christmas special last night. Tom and Gr, you think you've got an answer? What's what do you think it is, Tom? What do you got, Tom? Uh, uh, giving it a shot here is the back joy. Yes. The, it's the back right. joy. The back joy. <laughs> and I won't say – we're not going to say where anybody can get this stuff or anything like that. Uh, we're not going to toe the line. But I'll tell you, when I saw it, it was in a commercial. And uh, and, and we're sitting down, Angela and I, and we've been anticipating this, this event for like a year now. And so we're super pumped. And there's this commercial. And I look up, and there's a lady. And I think it was an AT&T commercial or something. It, you know, it had nothing to do with, with back massaging. And here's this lady – Relieving her stress with the back massager, my heart just broke into a million pieces because I lost mine a couple of days ago and I can't find it. I, just, I, I sat there and I was like, you're a real jerk rubbing it in my face oh. in this commercial. So, Tom, you win a fantastic sticker and magnet. How do you All feel right. about that? I'm, I'm thrilled about it. That's good. Uh, we're, we're thrilled for yeah. you, buddy. Yeah, we're going to go ahead. We're going to put you on hold, and that way we can get uh, some information from you, and we can make sure that we can connect that gift with you. Uh, once again, it's a uh, WPRR magnet that you can put on uh, your car or your refrigerator or anywhere around the house or workplace, as well as a Team Tiny Dancer decal that I have on the back of my car as well uh, everywhere I go. And so we're really grateful. And, yes, it's the back joy, my man. That's yes. great. I was following uh, Team Tiny Ban- Dancer for uh, for uh, the last uh, year or so, so I've, I'm thrilled to have that sticker. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Tom. We appreciate your support here at Paleo Radio, and I'll say it on behalf of my family that we appreciate your support for Team Tiny Dancer. Thank you so much. Yep, thank yep, you. Yep, we got Thanks, We're going to put you on hold. We'll put you on hold. All right, yeah. and then we have another caller. We only have a couple minutes here before we're going to have to get the break, but we'll bring him in. Hey, Rick, how are you doing? Like we lost him. That's okay. what, all right. So we want to we want to call back. Rick, thank Tom. Uh, we want to thank him again from GR uh, for calling us and properly identifying the challenge. We got to do this every week, and I know this was we'll kind something. of a weird one, but we got a winner. Yes, we got a winner, and you get the stickers and <laughs> yes. the awesome awesomeness and that's la- all involved. Last week we did one, Joe, but it was what was the most dangerous animal in the United States? And the answer was bees and wasps. Bees and, and wasps. Like they kill the most people. Yeah, they kill the most people. And they are animals. Insects are animals, folks. But that's nobody got reminder. it. Nobody got it. And so we weren't able to give away the magnet or the decal last week. But we wanted to make sure that we could do something this week. And I, I just thought it would be a lot of fun. It was a really random thing for me to see <laughs> on a commercial. I, and maybe it's like owning a Honda Element. That once you own it, you start seeing you it start everywhere. You start seeing it everywhere, you yes. Know? But, I, but boy, that back massager, I, I would have seen that for sure. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's so amazing, Joe. That is good stuff. Changed my life forever. Yes. So, again, Puritans, why Christmas got canceled or why they didn't like Christmas? Well, they were Puritans, of course. They didn't think that it was uh, cutting the right jib. It didn't fit what they wanted. Um, We'll talk about it a little bit more before we get into the next break, but stick around, folks. We will be right back. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Welcome back to Paleo Radio. And if you don't know, we listen to a bunch of different political uh, people here, political pundits and also politicians. One of them that we like to check out, especially this time of year, is Senator Rand Paul. Yeah, we do because he does something... That not a lot of politicians do. And I got to admit, man, I think that Rand Paul is a funny guy. I do, too. I think he's actually... I think he's I think funny. he's funny. I think he's creative. I still think he's one of the more original politicians that we have uh, in the United States. But on December 23rd, he wrote, Good morning, Seinfeld fans, and happy Festivus everywhere. 
Today I'll have my annual hashtag airing of grievances. Join me here throughout the day, and you can go and check out his his tweets on December 23rd where he airs his grievances. And, hey, one of them was uh, Rand, uh, Rand Paul said he hadn't seen so many billionaires in one place since scoping out Bilderberg with Alex Jones. Good times. That's great. Uh, talking about I mean, come Trump's on. cabinet. Come on. That's how hilarious. do you not love that? Yeah, it's hilarious. And so he's joking around about how Trump's cabinet is is loaded with uh, big wigs and huge money bags and stuff like that. And But this is uh, kind of uh, more on the sad line of things, Joe. But Diane Rehm. Yes. Yeah, Diane Rehm is no longer going to be having her show here on NPR. And that's that's upsetting just because, man, I'm so used to hearing her, and, and she's she's built quite a, uh, quite a show for herself. You know, I had a whole bunch of this stuff written down. NPR uh, did something really great about it, and I just want to say something small about it. In 1979, Rehm started as a host of the program aimed at homemakers. Mm-hmm. You know, and she said this. She said, and it was a quote. She's reflecting back. She said, unless I can change this show and do politics, do science, do medicine, do everything that's happening in the world, I'm out of here. And her manager said, yes, you will be. <laughs> like, like your show sucks if you don't do what you yes. want to do. And so uh, she, she did what she loved. Uh, she committed herself entirely to it. And that's, that's one of those success stories that I look at Paleo Radio and think the that's same thing. That's what we want. I, that's yes. what we want is to say we want to do what we love. Right, what we absolutely love to do, and and that we we do this in a way that's honest, that it aims to be fair, uh, legitimate, and you know she she admitted that one of the um, low points of her career, in fact, the article about it talks about how it was just last year's in the election season, and that she relied on, if, and this is a quote, fabricated internet reports. That, by the way, it should be read fake news. Yes. That is what that is. They, yeah. She relied on fake news, uh, and she asked Bernie Sanders about his supposed dual American and Israeli citizenship, mm-hmm. and he, uh, only that he doesn't have it. Yeah. And she called that a chief regret over decades of broadcasting. And I thought that was actually – Shows her honor. It shows her honor to say, you know, I made, I made a big mistake. I considered a low point. Um, you know, that I, I was duped by this. Yes. Um, especially with a career that didn't have that yep. very often. But going back to it about her saying it, what she wanted to do, she had to talk politics, she had to talk science, she wanted to talk about current events. That's exactly how we feel on the show, and that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish, too. So, hey, we salute you, Diane Rehm, for a job well done, and we really hope that we could one day be half as good as you are. And, so. if, and if, you, if you're really bummed, that uh, she's gone and that that kind of information and the way that that's funneled and the way that that's delivered, that it's gone, uh, and you see a value in paleo radio uh, filling a void of providing information in a way that's fair, in a way that's accurate and reliable, uh, you can go. We encourage you, in fact, very enthusiastically, go to patreon.com slash paleo radio and find out the different ways that you can help this show to continue doing so well. Yes, there's there's plenty of different ways. Number one, we'll say this just right out and out. You'll always get the show for free. You can always have it for free. We're never going to have it behind a paywall. But we do ask that if you like the show and you like what we do, that you can support it by giving us at least a dollar per episode. That's $4 a month or about as much as a weekly newspaper. Or the other thing you can do if you're strapped for cash, go into iTunes and just write us a good review. That will really, really help us. A good review on iTunes is... Is, it's gold. It's just – it's audio gold. It's so. it's more valuable than uh, frankincense and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it is the season. That's all right. We have a caller on the line, and we're going to have to get to him really quick, but we want to cover another topic afterwards, so just a couple minutes. How are you doing, Rick? How are you? We're good. How How's life? Well, it's going to be close to 50 degrees today, and the sun is out. Unfortunately, it's not going to last, but uh, what do you expect for December hey, twenty take, take it for a day, right? And uh, I'm sorry to hear about Diane Rehm, but um, I'm also sorry to hear about somebody else on your station that is no longer there. But I guess I can't talk about that, right? Well, I mean, we've we've covered it a couple weeks ago, yeah. but we're everyone's kind of uh, sad about that news, to be honest with you. Well, not yeah. everyone. But anyway, <laughs> no. about this Christmas deal, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you're mentioning some of the denominations that don't celebrate. I know Jehovah's Witnesses do not celebrate it. Uh, there's a lot of things they don't take part in, and of course... The history, as you were going through it there, about the Puritans is quite interesting because they were probably the most conservative types of Christians for their day, right? 
Yes, oh, they, yeah. they were. But when people say, oh, founding fathers, this is the thing that I always love is we were all founded on the Christian religion. Which one is always what I say? Because well, that, that that's such a sweeping statement because Puritans obviously didn't agree with Baptists or Catholics or Protestants that weren't even around at the well, time. Well, the, the, the Reformed people, the Calvinists, came over here from Holland and other European countries to America to escape persecution by the Catholic Church. But when they came over here... They persecuted denominations like the Baptists, for instance. Sure. Now, uh, it's interesting, too. You probably know about Bill O'Reilly and the war on Christmas and all that nonsense. Sure. Yeah, we're, he's on speed dial for me. Yeah, we chat with him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he doesn't seem to realize what you guys just uh, talked about there, that this actually... First of all, if you go way back, the Puritans actually were right. This, this uh, was involved with Mithra and the Saturnalia. Mm-hmm. And all this carousing that people say, you know, office parties and married people messing around, you know, getting drunk, that takes away the spirit of Christmas. No, that's what it actually began as. It had nothing to do with uh, uh, the birth of Jesus, who probably wasn't even born at that time of year. And uh, as a child, of course, I enjoyed the idea of Santa Claus, even though, you know, I thought, geez, how can a guy live forever at the North Pole? And how can his reindeer fly? How can he get in everybody's house around the world without a key in 24 hours? But when you're a kid, you believe it because you want to believe it, right? Yep, and because your parents tell you, and you believe what your parents tell you to be yeah. true. It's also the reason why people hang on to particular religious beliefs a little bit longer than they should, I well, believe. Well, I have some friends, you know, I'm not so sure how close they are anymore, but these guys were Dutch. They went to a church nearby. That was the first reason. Their parents took them. That was the second reason. Mm-hmm. Number three, there were a lot of other Dutch people there. And, and these folks, I can't believe they're so ignorant to think that the whole idea of Christianity, if you assume that's true to begin with, that this particular church in this particular location has the truth. That's right. And when people grow up, you know, it's, it's different when you're a child because you're pretty much under the control of your parents. But when people grow up and, don't ex- and continue to accept that without even searching to see whether it's true or not, but I wanted to speak about O'Reilly, if I could take. Yeah, a few we, we're going to have to. We're going to have to cut because really we. Oh, okay. we yeah. only, sorry, we only have four more minutes before we got to end oh, the I'm show sorry. here. Yeah, but Thanks we we love the call though. Thank yeah, you, Rick. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, and listen, you can anything that we that you're not able to cover on the show, we also track the Facebook as well as Twitter, and you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash paleo radio. On Twitter, we can be found at paleo radio show, and if you would like to email us about interviews or. Uh, about any kind of working alongside one another, collaboration, whatever you'd like. You can do that at paleoradioshow at gmail.com. And we're, we're kind of out of time here, Joe, toward the end. We don't have too much time but no. to bring up the fact that uh, there was a big situation that happened. And people should familiarize themselves with, with this debate because it's not going anywhere. It's just starting. But there was a piece over at Associated Press by Yosef Fetterman, uh, and it's called Israel – Humbled Netanyahu places hopes in trust and is talking about the U.N. Security Council's adoption of a resolution opposing Jewish settlements in occupied territory that underscores its fundamental and bitter dispute with the international community about the future of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And that can't be understated. That's actually a big Yes, deal. It, it's a big deal and also that the U.S. voted in favor of the sanctions on – and they voted in favor of this uh, judgment by the U.N. So this is a time where Israel is viewing this as the U.S. distancing themselves from Israeli politics. Um, but Donald Trump – this now, actually, before I get into that, we'll, we'll gut it down into sequential order. The U.N. had the vote on it to say if these settlements were illegal or not. The United States typically sides with Israel in every single vote that, that involves the U.N., the United States, this is Obama's administration, actually voted in favor of this U.N. resolution. Now, that, that flies in the face of a lot of the work that Israel, Israel and the United States have been putting together. And Donald Trump has said that when he goes in there, when he gets into town, it's going to be much different that they're going to they're gonna shape up. Yeah, he put a you know, cowboy hat on. Now, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how it goes. You know, and uh, – it's not entirely it's not entirely that big of a deal. I mean, it's on the one hand it's important because it's a statement. On the other hand, there is an aspect of this where it's largely symbolic. You know, the article points out that it doesn't include talk of sanctions or any other punitive measures against Israel. The resolution said the settlements have quote no legal validity 
and constitute a, quote, flagrant violation of international law. It also urged all states to distinguish between Israel and, quote, the territories occupied since 1967. It lays the groundwork. That's the importance of yes. it, is it lays the groundwork where it settles these disputes into categories and says this is not valid. Yes. This is not legally valid. So now the question becomes, what then is it? And what makes this a, even a bigger deal is that Donald Trump's new administration is rejecting the two-party solution, the two-state solution. So this is a ruling that's in favor of a two-state solution while you have the incoming president-elect saying that he's going to go the other direction. So there's a lot of news there. But, man, we are already to the end of it. We are. And listen, this is going to be the last time you're ever going to hear that this is exclusively secular media group. That's right. We are expanding. We are getting bigger. And we are doing it all on our own, folks. So keep tuned with Paleo Radio. There's tons of good things coming up. We'll be back next week. You're not going to want to go anywhere. Make sure to check us out on Facebook. Make sure to check us out on Twitter. Have a great week. You've been listening to Paleo Radio, exclusively with Secular Media Group.